each of the tables, very little yellow cards. And um, this, the, having this, the slides for the presentation is going to help you much. There's no text on these. Um, but if you write down this link at the bottom of the screen here, it's, um, it's a bit.ly link, so bit.ly, and then slash, and it's so create PDF, which is S-O-C-R-A-I-T, PDF. Um, there's a whole paper about what I'm going to talk about, and so if you decide you want to go back to it, revisit any of this information, you can go back there. And then the other reason I gave you my card is because um, sometime, maybe later today or tomorrow, I'll help, I'm recording this talk and it will go up on my website. So if you just go to my website later today or tomorrow, you'll you be able to revisit the talk there. So um, if you can just keep hold of that card, that'll kind of get you to the material later on. Um, so I'm a learning futurist. Uh, that's at least my job title, one of my job titles. I teach at a community college in Michigan in the U.S. And uh, primarily I teach mathematics, but I also work in what we call the Lyft Institute, which is uh, engaged in learning, innovation, future, and technology. And so when I was given the choice to come up with a job title for myself, uh, I was either going to be an education futurist or a learning futurist. And I decided that education futurist was too restrictive. Because I think that we actually uh, just do a disservice to ourselves by labeling some things as education and thus implying that the rest of the world somehow isn't an education. Um, now some of you have read this article. I'm just curious, how many of you have read the article about this? Okay, so not very many of you. So those of you who have read it, you're going to get some repeats, but maybe hopefully it will be enhanced by the personal experience. Um, uh, so anyways, um, let's, let's just get started. Um, I do want to also thank my illustrator, Matt Moore, who does a, a fabulous job of um, drawing me things for presentations. I call him and say strange things like, I want you to draw me something that models the internet. And we come up with a way to do that. So, anyway, so this is my uh, my model of the internet. I'm kind of giving a creds to Ted Stevens here. He said, you know, the internet is a series of pipes. You know, you turn them on and off, block them, they get you know, faster or slower or whatnot. So he drew the internet as a series of pipes, where the water flowing through the internet is kind of the information flowing through the internet. Um, what's interesting is that this this world we live in today with with all of this information flowing through the series of pipes. We have this, this term in, in tech circles, and for, the, for those people who really live quite a bit on the internet, um, that uh, participating these days, it, it's, it's like drinking from a fire hose. I'm sure many of you have heard that expression before. There's so much coming at you. It's coming at you from email, it's coming at you from text, it's coming at you from YouTube, it's coming at you from just about every possible uh, uh, digital venue, except possibly when you're out of the country. It's a, turns off. Um, but but it's, it, we have all this information coming at us and uh, trying to figure out what of, that, what of that is important, what of that we want to keep, what of that we should discard, even just getting the right filters in place to get the information we want is becoming very difficult. And then on top of that, all of these systems are starting to create their own filters. So I just want to do a, kind of an old-fashioned poll here. I want you to stand up if you have a Facebook account. Out in, in the real world. 
Okay? This is not education. This is just learning in the real world. And it's, uh, you know, quite complex. The problem with this system that we have here is that uh, the information is also leaking out. You know, if we consider our role in this, all this information is coming in, and most of the information is really just leaking out of our systems. You may have experienced this in the last few years. You start to have a conversation with somebody, and you know you have some relevant piece of information to share, to like add into the conversation, and you say something like this, oh, they did this study, well, I don't remember who, and it was, well, I don't remember what year it was either, but um, it said, well, generally, oh, I can't remember the details of that either. And it, it's, like you know that the information is there in your head. You know you've read something relevant, but you can't come up with any of the details. Well, the problem is we're just getting so much information and we're never revisiting the stuff that we find important. We're doing strange things like bookmarking it all. All right? I mean, most of us here probably have some system for bookmarking the stuff, the good stuff we get. We put it in folders in our email. We put it in, um, in uh, bookmarking sites, uh, Digo and Delicious and all those things. But we don't really have a good way to go back and access any of that information. Um, and so what happens is our, our brains are really just starting to lose everything. We're not, we're not good enough at dealing with this modern information flow to um, retain the stuff in biological memory that we want to retain. And biological memory is an interesting thing because um, we're not meant to remember everything we ever uh, learned and everything we ever experienced. We wouldn't want that. I mean, can you imagine what, what, the, what it would be like to remember every moment of every day? I mean, every moment? The time you spent in the shower, the time you were making dinner, you know, uh, all of the inane TV shows you watch. You know, like, do we really need to remember every detail? No, but we need to have a better way to remember the details we want to remember. And we do need to store some things in biological memory. So anyways, that's what, that's what we're going through. Um, now, we do have some systems that are becoming quite good at reminding us of things we want to be um, learning about. And Facebook is actually quite a good example of these systems. Because what it does is you go onto Facebook and you see the stream of information coming out of the people who you've said you want to get information from. And we get kind of addicted to this. We like it, you know, we, we like getting that information, and so we keep going back. Um, so we do have some systems that are good at churning information. Twitter is a, a good system for churning information. People retweet the things that are interesting, right? So you might not initially pay attention to something, but then five people you follow retweet it, and you say, oh, that's the fifth time I've seen that. I'm going to go check it out, right? So some of our technologies are starting to, to do this where um, more interesting stuff comes back over and over. Um, so, so let's, let's go back to this for a second. I, I think that this idea of bookmarking, you know, whenever I talk about this, some of you will say, well, we have technologies to keep track of information, right? We bookmark things, we store things, we can search, you know, all of those are, are great things, but I, I want to do another little poll. So um, stand up if you have some way of saving information you come across that's good. You put it in folders, you bookmark it on the internet, um, you keep a list somewhere. Good our exercise. Sorry, calisthenics. Stay standing. If you go back to look at, say, 20% of the stuff that you bookmark, you guys are a little optimistic, I think. 20% you go back to? I think? Stay standing if you go back to 50% of the stuff you look at. I should have started with five. Most of you bailed at 10, actually. So you guys think you go back to see more than 50% of the stuff you bookmark? That's pretty good. All right, you can sit down too. We've got three. I think the rate is pretty low. And, and you know, in a room like this, we're all people who are obviously have come to a conference to participate in a you know learning summit. So we're probably a little bit above the norm. But I would say that most of the time, even when I go back to look at my own lists of bookmarks, I find hundreds of bookmarks I haven't looked at in years. Right? I mean, I bookmarked them. Obviously, I thought they were important at some point, but I don't. I don't go back to them. And sometimes when I do go back to them, I go, oh, yeah, that was a great article. It had a really important point in it. I really wanted to remember that. But, I, but, but the point is that information is not coming back to me in the way that Facebook information comes back to me. And so I don't have a recollection of it even being there after the initial, ooh, I'll bookmark that. So I think that what we are now is we're kind of 
the scuba divers in the murky water of information and the internet. Um, we know that the stuff is out there, but we're having a really hard time sorting through all of the information and finding what it is that we are looking for and even finding the stuff that um, we know we've actually seen before and, and can't, just can't remember how to get to it. So here's the, the real world uh, internet, uh, the, the, all the pipes and all the different channels. And what is a particular problem to me is that this is education. <laughs> education locks itself off from the rest of the world. It does so in a variety of ways, from filters in schools that keep you from accessing the majority of the internet, to password protected learning systems that lock out everybody who's not a student, and even worse, lock out the students after they're not in your class anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and this is really kind of ridiculous, because if you think about how we learn outside of school, all of this information is freely available to us. All the newspapers put out information that's freely available. We'll ignore the fact that they're starting to try to put up firewalls, but there's so many ways around those. They're kind of silly at the moment. Um, you know, the, the thing that really bothers me about these systems is, you know, educators do a phenomenal job of, of, of structuring learning inside of these systems, and, and it really bothers me that my own students can't get access to the stuff, to the materials they learned with as soon as the last day of class happens. Or as soon as the last day of class happens, we lock them off and there's no way for them to get back in. Right? And that, that is really problematic, and if education does itself in in the next 10 years, because of the fact that there's a free ecosystem of learning and then the locked off system of learning. Well, we've done it to ourselves, I think. Um, because this, this just can't be. Um, and, and this trickle of stuff coming from the internet, you know, we, we tend to, to focus in education around things like textbooks and, and um, published materials. Uh, you know, one of the reasons, just in the defense of educators, one of the reasons we have a locked up system is copyright issues. Right? As educators, we get unprecedented ability to use copyrighted materials that you just don't get in the public sector. And, uh, and the reason we get that access and that ability to share copyrighted materials is because we agree to lock things behind a password-protected wall where the public cannot get to it. So I can share an article for an educational setting um, inside a password-protected system, and, and somebody in business could not do the same thing. So, part of, so in our defense, there's a reason why it's there. It's because all of this copyright stuff re requires it. But maybe that's not such a good defense. Um, so what I think we need to do is straddle the pipes of the internet. Okay, so this is my student straddling the pipe and learning off the, um, the, the real world of the internet. I think we need to embrace all of the stuff that's out there uh, and basically create a new ecosystem for learning. Make sure I don't get myself too out of order here. Um, so this this student right here, I'm going to focus in on the student. The student or the learner or the adult or whoever it is that's doing the learning in our modern society, unless they're enrolled in a class, we'll ignore the students who are enrolled in a class. Okay, everybody else who's learning outside the system, they live in this world that's incredibly complex. Movie plots of today. Have you ever thought about sitting down and diagramming a movie plot? for any kind of modern movie, and they're incredibly complex. There's hundreds of TV channels. Um, they have immersive video games. They have access to all the world's information from mobile devices. Um, it's, it's an incredibly complex world. Um, in order to reach these students that, that we want to engage, we need to, I'm getting distracted by everybody setting up cameras here, I'm sorry. Um, you, this is all on the internet, you can get it later. You can get everything up on here later. Okay. Um, in order to access, in order to engage these students, we have to give them a stake in what they're learning. When students go into the, the um, education system, we tell them what they're going to learn, and we, we give them very little choice about what specifically they can do in there. Um, so I think that if we're going to compete with all this other stuff, with all the entertainment that's available for them to, to use, they have to have a stake in what, in what they choose to actually learn. And you know, we've talked about this idea, I'm going 
go back here for a second. We talked about this idea of personalization in education, right? I can't tell you how many times somebody has forwarded me Sir Ken Robinson's talks. Anyone else heard them? It's all about personalization. We can fix education if we have personalization. Anyone ever heard Sir Ken Robinson explain how? No, he hasn't really, has he? He, he, he talks a lot about, you know, we need personalization in education. He's not the only one. A lot of thought leaders in education get up and give these great stump talks about how personalization is going to save us. Um, but we have a, a serious problem in that the economics are not in favor of personal education. The economics are in favor of batch education. We can't even afford the batch education we have, especially in the U.S. Canada does a much better job of supporting education than the U.S. Um, and so how do you... How do you uh, get personalized education while well, not sacrificing um, the need to actually have assessment and accreditation and, and, and issues like that. To, somebody has to be able to certify what it is you've learned. Well, how do you do that when you also have personalized education? So I want to propose a system to do that. Um, the kind of futurist I am, I like to, it's always bothered me looking at the problems of the future. You know, I, I'm one of those people who reads all the books about the apocalyptic events and movies and things like that, and they all bother me, right? And, I, and so I like to look at problems, and I don't like to talk about problems until I can talk about a future I can see that actually involves a solution. Um, and so this is one of those cases. And it took a while to think of this one. Um, so what I want to do is take us back to kind of a pristine environment where there is no educational system, okay? So imagine that you are an alien and you're dropped into today's world, okay? with the internet, mobile phones, immersive games, immer virtual environments, um, access to, free access to information, and you don't know that education exists. There is no formalized education. What would you build in order to use all of that information, uh, learn from all of that information, and be able to certify that somebody has actually done the learning they say they have? Right? And so if you, if you just completely wipe out everything that's happened in educational systems in the last 200 years, you can get some kind of interesting results. And I'd like, to, I'd like to just come back to Facebook for a second because Facebook did something really interesting. It disrupted communication, not by attacking communication head on, or not by attacking the traditional system of communication head on. If you think about it, we used to actually use phones to call people. And, you know, probably some of you still do. <laughs> but I actually just got a new office and it has no phone. I said, you know what, don't worry about it. I can call people from my computer. Okay? So what Facebook did is they did not, they did not attack the telephone. They did not, you know, say, well, people are using a phone and we're going to create a new phone. They just said, we're going to create a completely new way to communicate. And lo and behold, when they created a new way to communicate, a good way to communicate, an engaging way to communicate that involved in no way, shape, or form what was traditionally happening, which was calling people and talking to them with audio, they actually managed to get back onto everybody's phone, right? And I would, I would venture that most teenagers probably use Facebook on their phones, or texting, more than they actually call people on their phones. So Facebook managed to disrupt the very technology it, it, it uh, is now on, not by attacking it directly. And so, this is what I think needs to happen in education. Rather than say, how can we change education, just forget about it. We can't change education. I mean, we really can't. It's a behemoth. It, it doesn't change. Anytime somebody like reaches out to do something new, and there are beautiful examples of individual schools doing fantastic things, and I think he showed us a great example in an earlier talk. But the problem is that when the leader leaves that school, or the visionary committee leaves that school, or the funding dries up, the educational system reaches out its arm and goes and sucks it back in, right? I mean, it's just an enormous system. So how do you disrupt education? You build something else. And you let that something else seep back in and disrupt education because at some point you can't ignore it. The same way that smartphone manufacturers can't ignore Facebook apps and putting Facebook, and many of them preload Facebook onto the phones. It's such a desired requirement that it just comes on the phones. Well, let's build something else. And let's let that become so powerful that education can't help but accommodate it. That's what I think needs to happen. So I think what we do is we go back to the time of the, the Greek philosophers, and we think about um, how, how formal education actually started. And formal education started with mentoring and tutoring. 
And if you wanted your son or daughter, if you were rich, and you wanted your son or daughter to become an educated person, you, uh, you found them a personal tutor, you sent them somewhere to, to have that personal experience, and they worked maybe one-on-one -on -one or one to a few to learn a topic. Uh, and this is actually a very, uh, a very effective system. Any of you have ever had a tutor, you know, it's a very effective way of learning. You ask your questions, they help you get through the things you're learning. There's a great study called um, the Bloom's Two Sigma, Bloom's Two Sigma problem. Has anyone read that study? No? Okay, so go look it up. You, I'm sure you've heard of Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom was also famous for a study he did in 1984, I think. Two Sigma problem, and they basically looked at um, mastery learning and, and tutoring versus traditional means of education. And uh, at, at the end of the study, they found that uh, the students who got mastery learning and tutoring um, learned more than 98% of the students who were in traditional instruction, which is two, two Sigma, uh, two standard deviations for the mean, 98% more. So we know it's incredibly effective if we can get to this personalized learning, if we can get there, right? Um, not only did they learn more, but they learned it at a higher level than 80% of the students in a traditional means. So it's incredibly effective. We know that, okay? Now, I had to give this system a name because it's hard to talk about a system that doesn't exist yet without calling it something. And saying the system that doesn't exist yet gets a little tiring. So I call this Socrate, and it's kind of a play on words. One, because I'm looking at it as a Socratic learning system. So, play on that. Um, the SOC is for social, the AI is for artificial intelligence, the IT is for information technology. So it's, it's just my shorthand version of what this system will look like when we get there. Okay, so the first thing that we need a system to do is to regulate um, what we actually want to store in biological memory. So we need some way to, to open up the, the floodgates to just the right amount so that we learn what we mean to be learning. Um, and I think that realistically, most of us probably, and you can try it yourself on a little piece of paper or something, most of us probably can't learn about more than three topics well at a time. You know, so as soon as you add that like fourth topic, you start to do something badly. You know, so, you know, for me, my topics, I look at the scholarship of teaching and learning, I look at game design, I look at learning analytics, or something like that. And as soon as I add a fourth to that list, something falls off, and I'm just not able to follow it anymore. So one of the things I think a system would do is be very good about kind of keeping you in control and saying, you know, if you're really trying to retain stuff in biological memory, if you're really trying to become an expert at some field, you probably can't try to learn everything. And one of the problems we're having right now is I think we are trying to learn everything, and everything doesn't work. So we're going to capitalize um, on a, a system of learning called a, a spaced learning repetition algorithm. And this is based on a study that came 100 years before the Bloom study. This is based on the Ebbinghaus uh, forgetting curve. And uh, Ebbinghaus did this kind of famous set of experiments where he memorized uh, random words and saw how long it took him to forget those words and if he re-engaged, how well did he retain the information. And what we find here, if you look at uh, the, t the time that you're still remembering it and the, the strength of the memory, how good the memory is, with every time you re-engage, so these, these lines here are re <coughs> with every time you re-engage, the slope of the forgetting curve lessens. So the more you re-engage with an idea, the more likely you are to remember it long term. If you only see an idea once, and then you lose it, but you don't ever see it again, this is what happens. And this is what's happening with those, those, uh, those things where we, we go to an article, we read it, we think it's fantastic, we bookmark it, and then we never go back. And the problem is if you never go back, you're on this curve right here, right? If you go back to it once, you're on a slightly less of a forgetting curve. If you go back to it another time, your forgetting curve is even less. So the more you engage with that information, the more likely you are to remember it in your biological memory for long term. Now, I can go back here for a second. This is where somebody always says, but we don't need to remember things in biological memory. Would somebody like to be that person today? We don't need to because we can access anything we want to know on the internet. There you go. We don't need biological memory anymore. We can access anything off of our cell phones and our computers, right? Except, of course, when there's not internet, right? <laughs> Which doesn't happen very often, realistically, in our world. It doesn't happen very often. But I would actually... 
actually argue with that and say that we do need to remember some things. You are not going to be an expert in your field if you have to Google every single thing you want to say. I couldn't give up here and give this talk if I had to Google every piece of information that I was about to share with you. Right? I mean, it's just not realistic. You wouldn't want your doctor to, to be uh, talking to you and say, huh, I'm not sure what that symptom might mean. Hold on a second, let me look it up. You know, now on the one hand, we would want them to do that if they really didn't know, right? But they wouldn't be a good doctor if they had to do that with every patient that came in. To be an expert in your field, there's a, um, a, a book that's come out recently. I'm curious whether you guys know the name of the author. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold back that information for a second. It says that you need to do something for 10,000 hours to become expert. Who's the author? Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. And the book is? Malcolm Gladwell. Michael Gladwell, very good. So, um, now I remember the 10,000 hours, but I did have to look up who the author was, because I couldn't remember if it was Gladwell or, um, I don't remember the other guy I was confusing him with, but um, uh, Seth Godin, I couldn't remember which one of those it was. But, I had to remember the 10,000 hours thing. I mean, I had to be exposed to that and I had to remember it to know what I was looking up, right? And so I had to hold that piece in my logical memory. I had to have said to myself at some point, this is important information, I want to remember it, and then do some things, have some conversations with people, mention it in conversation, do something to remember it myself, right? Um, so I would argue that while we do have the internet and unprecedented access to information, we cannot rely on it to become experts in our fields. To become experts in our fields, it requires practice, discussion, writing, um, and remembering enough of the details to be able to put together new, coherent ideas and innovations. So how do we do that when we're deluged completely with information? Well, I think what we need to have is a new media, a new media layer on the internet. Um, we have all sorts of media layers on the internet. We have, uh, if you think about just the ecosystem that's popped up in the last year of like buttons on everything, right? Any website you go to, there's a like button. You press the like button and it, you like it in Facebook, right? Which then changes what the information stream you get in Facebook. Um, we have uh, systems that allow you to tweet things. I mean, that's a layer of media on the internet. But if you just think about the media that's on the internet, we have a text layer, we have an audio layer, we have a video layer. Um, what we need to have is a learning layer that goes over everything, that you can access from any website, from any video, from any audio, from any game, any, any place you might conceivably learn something, any conference, that you can go into some kind of learning system and tell the system this is something I want to I want to remember, I want to have it come back to me a few times um, so that I do retain it in biological memory. And so uh, we need basically learn this button next to all of those other layers on the internet. So I, I think it should look something like this. Um, how many of you have heard of TED Talks? I'll just let you raise your hand. Great, good. Um, so, you know, you, you go and you watch a TED Talk. I, I always learn some interesting things from TED Talks, and I would really like to be able to sometimes remind myself of little pieces of those talks, you know, when I'm going to go back and write a paper or I'm trying to kind of gel some ideas. Um, so what I want to see, you know, next to that is the button, you know, with all the other buttons that you can use to, to engage with that information. And when you press that button, um, you would be basically taken into a learning system where you could say, this is the site, this is, you know, you pick out what information is important to you, and that's going to be different for me, or for you, or for you, or for you. We might all take a different thing away from reading the same article or watching the same video. Okay. So, um, we go into our system, I'm going to jump to where my, I have my system, it might look something like this. Can you tell it what the URL is, you maybe can even mark the spot in the video or the audio or whatever to go in and um, you can either, so, so that the basic idea is simply, this is not very high tech, you write some kind of question or prompt to yourself about what it is you want to remember and then you can clip out the answer or write an answer for it and again we all might have different questions and answers. Right? Because what's important to me in my context is completely different for you in your, your context. Um, so then you might, uh, you might link this with one of your you know, learning goals, the, maybe the top three things that you said you want to be learning about, so that you know which categories. And that also kind of reminds you, don't overdo it. You only have so much brain power. You can only devote so much brain power to each goal. Uh, you can have tags on it, you know, the standard things we see on the internet. 
And you, you would probably also get the option down here to make this either public or private. Now, do you want to share your question or do you want to keep it to yourself? And so there could be a, a list here of existing questions. You could actually go and see, well, what have other people taken away from this video or this article? That might be of interest to me. Of course, if you're in a really you know, competitive field, you might want to keep all of your questions private because you don't want people to know what you're learning. But you know, that's another issue. So, so it's a basic, basic system, no multiple choice questions, nothing like that, just a simple question and answer. Because we're not going to let the system evaluate how well you know something. You're going to evaluate how well you know it. And that's really where the technology is powerful. Um, because too much of the time, we, we insist that the computer must tell us whether we know something. And that's too hard. We don't have the technology for that yet. We probably will 20 years from now. We already have it mapped. But math is very uh, technical and very easy to do that with. And we have computers like Watson now, so we're, we're getting closer to that. But my guess is that technology is 20 years out. So what happens between now and then is we, the humans, evaluate how well we know something. Um, and so we can access this uh, platform then. The idea would be to have a spaced repetition model. So information comes to you over time. You see it again. So you might be at your computer. You might be at your phone, um, at a doctor's office or waiting for your kids to come back from a sports event or something like that. And, um, and you go into your system and it, it'll just start feeding you back your own questions. Or you could, you could even say, well, I just want to answer questions today about game design. You know? All right, well, here's the questions that you chose. You look at the question. I'm going to jump ahead here for a second here, right there. You look at the question. You think to yourself what the answer is, or you say to yourself what the answer is. You don't have to type it or anything like that. You're the one evaluating how well you do it. You chose it. If you lie to yourself, who would you be hurting? You. Okay, so there's not really much of a point. Um, except maybe later we'll see why you might want to cheat. But So you might have a very simple system where you rate one, two, or three. How well did you know it? Where one is like, I nailed it. Two is, well, I kind of knew it. Three is, wow, I had no idea. But of course, if you chose three, if three was your, your option, it would say, well, hey, do you want to go back to the article, the video, whatever, and rewatch it? If you didn't know it very well and it was something you chose, then maybe it's time to go back and rewatch it. Um, so it's a very simple system of, of self evaluation, basically, uh, where the computer basically just functions to, to feed you back the information you say you want to learn over time. And then you can access it from wherever. So here's my little guy fishing with his cell phone. Um, waiting for the fish to bite and, and learning on the system. We can, uh, I think, also have an evaluation system built into this. So these are my, my back to my Greek philosophers. In, the, in this time period, if you wanted to test somebody on whether they knew a topic, you would simply talk to them. Right? You'd have your, your scholar who asks questions and the student who answers it, and through that you would assess whether or not somebody knew stuff. There's no reason why we couldn't use a system like this to do the same thing. Um, we could have an expert in that field, like say, say the field is uh, chemistry, for example. So you have some uh, chemist scholars that are paid to basically be the assessors. Um, if you need an assessment, if you need to have somebody t say, well, yes, this person is certified, they know this topic, then you would go to a, to a scholar. And you'd say, all right, here's access to my system. It says I know these 500 questions. I need you to verify that I do. It could be a curated set of questions. You know, some American Chemical Society could say that you know knowledge of basic inorganic chemistry could be compromised by these 500 questions. So it could be 500 questions of your choice. Um, so the scholar would access your questions and um, basically just have a, a random assortment pop up on the computer. So. Uh, the question pops up, the scholar looks at it, they ask you the question, you have a little conversation about it, they decide whether you knew it or not. They, of course, can see the answer right there. They might not know the answers to 100% of your questions, but if they are an expert in the field, there's no reason why they can't look at the questions and answers and, and determine whether they are appropriate or not. And so again, you're relying on a human being to decide, to make the assessment of, does this person know what they're talking about? If you think about it, it's a much better system than what we do right now, which is multiple choice tests. And multiple choice tests just test a random assortment of knowledge, right? You have a body of knowledge, and your multiple choice tests test, you know, what, 5%, 1% of what you're supposed to know? A random five, 1 or 5%. So a system like this would also test a random 1 or 5%, but it would do it in a way where you could maybe get a little bit better idea of whether the person knows what they say they know. And there's no reason why you couldn't test on any topic. Topics that are currently in schools, topics that are not currently in schools. And if you think about the way this works right now, when, when the new field comes,
comes out and you want to learn about it. Like, um, uh, it was mentioned this, this field of learning analytics, which is much better in Canada than the U.S., I think. Um, it's a very new and emerging field. And uh, there's no textbooks. There's no courses. There's no degree programs, at least not that I know of. All right, so if you want to learn about this field and get certified somehow right now, there's really no way to do it. But with a system of questions like this, with every new article that comes out, new questions could be written. You could have a question bank. And at some point, if you need to certify as an expert, you need to find somebody who is already certified to go through your questions. Anyone in here a ham radio operator? Used to be. So there is a system of tests like this for ham radio operators. It's a whole hierarchy of um, learning that takes place. People keep trying to get to higher and higher levels. Um, and what emerges is kind of a community that pushes the rest of the community to get, to get better. But I guess my point is that with a system like this, we wouldn't have to wait for a textbook to be published, a course to be developed, and a degree to be approved in order to learn something and be the expert at it. Now, there is a motivation issue here. We're motivated to go look at something like Facebook because we want to see what our friends are doing. We want that little, like, surge of uh, excitement when somebody likes something we do, things like that. So there is a question of can we take a group of people who have basically removed learning as part of their value posit and make them want to learn again. Wow, is it like doing something outside? Interesting. It's raining. Raining. Okay. Is that what that is? Yeah, we okay. have that in Michigan. to go in and keep learning and keep engaging. Um, just to give you a sense of the value cosm in the U.S., uh, the average adult in the U.S. has um, five to six hours of leisure time a day on average. This is based on two, 2010 statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The average adult in the U.S. spends 30 minutes a day on educational activities. Three hours a day watching television. Now, that's actually quite, you might think 30 minutes a day, well, that's pretty high. And it is, it's an average, right? Which means that some people are spending five hours a day on learning activities, like the ones who are in school, and there are plenty of people spending zero hours, right, to compensate for that, to come up with a figure of 30 minutes a day. What's important to us is things like sports, entertainment, that those are all the things that have been valued by our society. So how do we get people to revalue learning and make that something that's really important, not just in school, but out of school. And I like to say that, you know, as soon as you get your degree, people are basically done learning. I mean, it, most people just are, are done. They think that learning stops when they get handed the piece of paper. And they get a little bit annoyed when they're actually asked to learn in their business or, or whatnot. So we need, that needs to somehow be fixed. So I think we do that with the game layer. And I think it probably looks something like this. This is a future, future version of uh, maybe something like LinkedIn. Okay. So you have all your, the stuff that's on LinkedIn now. Stuff. And then you might have stats for what you're currently learning, how engaged you are in that learning. Because wouldn't that be more valuable to you as an, a potential employer to know what somebody is currently learning about and how active they are in that field? Think about what a resume gives you. It gives you that I went to these three schools and what degree I got in them. But does it tell you whether I still remember anything related to those degree programs? I mean, I have a, I have a bachelor's degree in biology. You don't want me teaching a biology class today. It's been a long time since I've done work in biology, right? But my resume would tell you I'm qualified, right? Something like this would tell you that that's not something I'm doing lately. That lately I've been, you know, learning these topics and I've been getting to higher and higher levels of them. It could tell you how engaged, how many questions a week do I engage with. I mean, given the choice between two people who look completely alike degree-wise on paper, I would always want to hire the one who's currently engaged in learning. They're the ones who are going to be the more valuable employees to me. So I think we create kind of a game layer based on reputation statistics, where your reputation for learning comes with you wherever you go. And if you, if you can future yourself forward to a time when a system like this might actually be in place and start to leak into education, those students who leave that educational system could take this with them, right, into their regular lives. They would be used to a system where 
You're expected to decide, I want to be learning about these things, leveling up in those areas, to the point where when you get to the top level, you're the one writing the questions, doing the assessing in any topic area. Right? So what does the educator do in all this? This is my little educator right here. Um, I think the role of the educator is changing, although I'm not as optimistic to say that schools are going away anytime soon. I think schools serve one function we all like to forget about when we're talking about these, and that is that they babysit. And so unless one person from every household will be in the home all day working from home, we're not anywhere close to that right now. Or one person's willing to give up their job to stay home with their children who are learning in the living room, that's not happening anytime soon. There will be some place that people go to learn. So what of the educator in a system like this? Well, they would be the coach. I think educators should be called learning coaches right now. I think we should change what we call instructors and teachers and professors. What we are is the learning coach. The content is starting to teach itself. This is a whole other talk. But if, in a world where the content is starting to teach itself, what we still need are good coaches. And so we're going to do one more little poll here. This is always nervous to do it in a room like this. I want you to stand up if you've ever said to yourself, I want to learn how to speak fill in the blank language. If you've ever said to yourself, I want to learn how to speak some language, stand up. learning 
learning management system that's based on students proposing questions and students answering each other's questions and then rating the answers for who's got the best answer to the questions. Uh, it's a very interesting little system um, that you might check out. So those are five that are close. But I think, I think as we look at this problem, there will be my time, so I'm out of time now. Okay. <laughs> as we look at this, this, uh, this problem of how to fix education, I really think that we need to focus our energies on building the right thing, a side of education. And letting that grow up and become very, very powerful. I mean, think about if, if, I, if I was a business and I had a choice between using something like So Create Stats or using something like a diploma or using both. I would rather have both, ideally. But in many emerging fields, the fields are so new that there's no degree program for them, right? And so something like So Create would work so incredibly well to educate people in modern topics. Um, and so I think that's the kind of system we need to look at. If it became powerful enough, it really would work its way back into education. Education couldn't ignore it. And I think that's really the only way to fix education. I've been, I mean, my, my PhD work is in education. It's in higher education. And after studying higher education for six years, I can say that I don't see anything else that's going to move it. Um, it'll either die its death, the way it's going right now, or something from the outside will, will be so powerful that it will change the path of education. But I don't see it happening. I think we should stop trying to focus our efforts so much there and try to focus our efforts on changing the, the value cosm to be one of learning um, and that that value cosm change will shift the educational system um, on its own. So I'm going to take a couple questions if we have time. Yes? Can you comment on, you know, Montessori does some of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. plus she had some technology, plus some other issues. I mean, you have the coaching aspect. I don't want to do blocks today, but I'll do painting today. You know, just trust me. something simple. Um, you have to accomplish something. So, what do we want to work on today? Uh, you get that reinforcement issue there. How? I mean, how do you the, only, see? the only problem with using that as a parallel here okay. is that the Montessori system is focused on early childhood education. Okay. Early childhood education is nothing like preparing somebody to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or an, or an okay. educator. I mean, those are, are fields where the amount of knowledge that has to be learned is incredibly high. It's not fostering the creative experience, which Montessori does fantastically well. I mean, it's a very good for an open-ended, broad-based experience. But in specific fields, I think we need something else. And I think Montessori is a great example. We can look at that as an example of, of something that does do it well. But, you know, I'm not sure how well a medical student would do on, on a system like Montessori. I think, I think they actually could learn medicine very well. It would just take 20 years instead of six. Yeah, four organs at a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Other questions? Yes.
by all means the best one, um, that spaced repetition works. The question is actually the motivational part. Can we motivate people to use something like this? That's the bigger issue. But I would say that game designers are actually the people to talk to on this because they can motivate anybody to do just about anything by creating the right game. If you think about the amount of time people spend playing stuff like Bejeweled, it's a really dumb game. I mean, I love it, I play it. It's a really dumb game. I mean, it's, it's like total fluff, right? But they get you to keep playing it, right? So I think the bigger, the bigger issue is actually motivation um, rather than does it work. There was a great article in Wired Magazine about this too, um, and I can't remember the title or the author's name at the moment, but you know it? Uh, yes, and I'm actually launching a website today. Okay, and uh, the title? Okay, and the title of the article was? Spacing effect, yeah. something like that. Okay. But, um, yeah, just a quick announcement. Uh, we're going to launch a business based on that uh, during this conference. Great. Right. Uh, they'll launch the right page 36. Okay, yeah. well, I'll, I'll come in. Yeah. Okay, uh, Tim, you have a question? Uh, well, actually, just a comment. Yes. Which is um, last year I did some work with the National Academy of Sciences on gaming construction and, and its learning uh, qualities. But the most interesting thing is that the you know, National Academy always needs a sponsor. The sponsor was the Department of Defense to teach soldiers how to learn more quickly. Yeah, Department of Defense is not surprising at all because the Department of Defense is one of the largest university systems in the country. Defense Acquisition University. They educate 200,000 people a year, and they use mobile apps, they use virtual worlds, they are leveraging all this stuff. So I think we better end because I think we have another talk starting. So. I'll just call it good there, and you have my contact information. And